beautiful. There That's you beautiful. Go. All of this, I'm admiring all of this. Boy, you people are gifted. I love this village. Oh, yeah. We love you too. They meant yes. so much to me <clears throat> in the ministry. And uh, just love you so much and your people. And Ron, you've always been a blessing. You know, your wife to me too, and so many of you. Thanks for being here today, and really thanks for asking me to come back. Yeah, I'm so uh, uh, You had reason probably not to, for many reasons, but I think this is the fifth or sixth year. Oh, it's at least six. At least six. So uh, some of us are fading away a little bit every year, a little more. Uh, I, I don't do as good at 93, I know, as a... Uh, I did last year at 92. <laughs> I saw, I told my wife this morning, I said, you know, I just don't have hardly any strength like I used to have. And she said, well, I just saw where a lady had her 114th birthday today. I said, my land, that tires me out to even think about <laughs> But uh, it's been so good to be with you. Love you in the Lord. It is a wonderful thing. My grandson, my oldest daughter, she's got four children and they're all in the ministry. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Yes. And this one is her oldest one. He was pastoring a church up at Leadville, Colorado. And his wife uh, was an asthmatic and she almost didn't make it up there. So they had to resign. And how do you like the Lord opened up the door yeah. over here to church? They call it Cross Point now. I call it North Valley. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, but he's the new pastor over there now. He's 41 years, going to be 41 in November. And he has uh, five beautiful children. Amen. His oldest. It's 14, the youngest is two. Mm. But uh, he loves the Lord, he's a very humble man, and uh, loves the Lord so much. Now I wanna tell you, how many of you listen to Morning Inspiration? You ever listen to that yes. program Linda does? Uh, yeah. Well, if you don't, every morning I have for 50 years had a program called Morning Inspiration. I had it before we, took over KVIP. By the way, next year is 50 years for KVIP. Oh my gosh. We're going to be celebrating our golden anniversary next year. And you'll have to be sure and get a part. We're going to have some pens and some shirts and bookmarkers and things to remind you how good God is. And, uh, and I want to say that when I went into the ministry, I had a a lot of, of excuses why I couldn't do this and that. I just was so scared. I I was a farm boy, came from a very, as you know, and very poverty-stricken family. We didn't have running water or we didn't have, we had a house that leaked like a sieve. But anyway, God took care of us. And I learned more through my mom's prayers and meeting our needs in any other way. Us five kids. Mom was a prayer warrior. She was a woman of faith. And that's why I have always wanted to go by faith. When I came with the people up here, there were eight men and 15 women. I said, are you people of faith? And they said, what do you mean? I said, are you willing to trust God and give him all the glory for what he's going to do? And they said, yeah, yes, we will. Well, they did. So there were 10 building programs, and we never borrowed money once from any institution. Can you imagine that? Yes. I could tell you so many outstanding stories, how God met those needs, and we give him the glory for it. Amen. And we started, when we started the radio station, they said, Pastor, how are you going to make it there? I said, by faith. And they said, well, he can't do that. I said, well, we'll see. We have our 50th anniversary next year. We're still going by faith. 
you know, we have a share of thought of Christ a year, yes. and people give, and it's still on the air, and God's even enlarged it to his glory. <laughs> it's all God, see? And they about fell over, and I said, we're going to start the mission and run it by faith. A couple men didn't think we could do it. I said, well, God can do it. That's the thing you got to see. And you know what? We're still running the Good New Rescue Mission by faith. Yes. And all by faith. Yes. You know why I like to do it that way? Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I want, I have a number of Timothys. I've met with Jim Pope for 30 years. I've been one of my Timothys, trained him along in scripture. It's basically every month I meet with Jim. He's out of town or he'd have been here today. Pray for uh, Norma Komnick. She's really having her problems, you know that. But when I went into the ministry, I thought, Lord, I don't know much about what I'm doing, but I know I want to serve you. I'd come home from World War II. God spared my life during the invasion of Okinawa. And God uh, encouraged me to go by faith to college. Now, I wasn't any brain, and that scared me to death. But uh, I, I did what the Lord wanted. And you know, uh, God got me through school. Mm -hmm. God got me through school. But uh, I have an idea on my uh, tombstone. I'd like to have this little thing. Before I close my eyes in death, I pray that I might be that kind of person God would choose in his great ministry. That I might share my life in a warm and loving way by touching every heart until God calls me home someday. And I trust that when I'm gone, those lives he brought my way may carry on the message of Christ's gracious love to save. Now that's good for you too, isn't it? Amen. Isn't that a good thought? Yes. yes. When I came down with my lung problem and I had trouble, they, put me on oxygen some time ago at home. I stay on it quite a bit. But I said, I'm not going to give up my broadcast. So I still have my daily broadcast, five minutes Monday through Friday. And I still oversee the things at the radio station, at the mission. I still try to keep people encouraged. Because it's all God, not us, just yeah. encouraging one another. <laughs> and uh, I thought of that. And I tried to encourage dads. I, what tore my heart out, I heard last week on a program that they said 80% of black children are raised in a non-father's home. Kids like their dads. I liked my dad. He was blind in one eye. He was handicapped. He was a farmhand. But I love my dad. I love my mother. Great folks. But. Uh, I like this poem. I'll share it with you. Walk a little plainer, Daddy. He said a little boy so frail. I'm walking in your footsteps, and I don't want to fail. Sometimes your steps are very plain. Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little plainer, Daddy, for you are leading me. I know that once you walked this way many years ago, and what you did along the way, I'd really like to know. For someday when I'm tempted and I don't know what to do, so walk a little plainer, Daddy, because I must follow you. Someday when I'm growing up, you're like I want to be. And I will have a little boy who will want to follow me. And I would want to teach him right and tell him to be true. So walk a little plainer, Daddy for we are following you. I like to encourage dads that way. You know, in these 70 years in the ministry, I've counseled hundreds of people, literally, and that's not to both just explain, 
that the ministry is in need of, of people getting help. You know, a shepherd, as Brother Paul can tell you, people need encouragement and help and direction at times. That's why we started the mission. I couldn't understand why so many people were not willing to help those who were in need of help. Man, you know, we have some, at our graduation, I saw a medical doctor down in LA at my sermon, where I preached my first sermon at the Union Rescue Mission on 3rd in Maine. That's where I preached my first sermon. I had 30 some men saved that night. There were about 600 men there. But uh, at our last graduation from the mission, we have our new life program. <clears throat> this last time, you know, there was a, uh, two young men that took courses out at Shafta College in line with our new life program there at the mission. And one of them graduated magna cum laude. Wow. And the other of them graduated 4.0. Wow. And then there was one there that graduated. He's a former pastor. Can you imagine that? But he was renewed in his life yeah. and helped the mission. I can't tell you the number of people we've seen help down there. I had them come up to me and I'm in town. I had a man cry and put his arms around me. Thank you for saving me. I said, I didn't save you. Only Christ can save you. Well, you started the mission. Well, that's all right. It was all God. It was all God. It's just all God. And you know what we leave behind when we go is going to be very important, isn't it? Yes. Very important. I believe the Lord's returning soon, folks. I believe that uh, there's a lot of reasons to believe that. I go back over these years and I can see from whence we've come to where we are. And I believe there's a lot of things indicating today that we need to redeem the time. Yes. Buy up the time. <clears throat> I know that Billy Graham, one of his last messages was the redeeming of the time. And I thought of that. I thought of the brevity of life. I've often said that. Life is short. Death is sure. Sin's a curse, but Christ is a cure. Yeah, that's good. I used to like to state that from the pulpit. And I have noticed not only the brevity of life, my it seems like it goes so fast anymore. Now some of you that are a little older, you know it goes faster as you get older, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. And you know the rapidity of life is another thing. You know there's a dash on the tombstone from when you were born to when you passed away, they put on there. And what mounts is, what's on that, that dash? What's in between the day we were born and the day we were buried or died? It all makes a difference. That's why I always like this little saying, what are we doing for Jesus? Neutral we cannot be. Someday his, he will be asking us, what are you doing with me? Or he will be asking us, what will you do with me? In, in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed that a man wants to die. Now I have had the privilege of leading people to, to death, to, bed, to the Lord on their deathbed a couple different times. Thank God he got saved. The thief on the cross got saved. But you know, it's not good. I try to witness to all the people, my, my waitresses, and different ones, and in my doctors. I always pray for my doctors, and you know I led one of my doctors to the Lord, and he's in charge of one of the leading rehab centers here today. But you know, I often think of the need of using time wisely. I look back and I think, boy, Lord, if I could do it over, there's a few things I might do different. But I look back and I see how I didn't plan anything. Do you know I want to tell you that, Ron? I didn't plan anything at least that, that, that went on. When I came to Reading, I didn't know what God was going to do. I just knew there was a little group of people that wanted to start a church. And I knew I wanted to get up where I could work, missionary work in our own country because I'd studied these areas up here in the mountains, even up to Aden. We had, I'd gone up to Aden, of course, and up clear up to Ashland, Oregon. So I didn't realize what God was going to do with that group of people. But God knew, and God opened the doors, 
and we just by faith follow. Now that's why I'm leaving behind this thought with any of you who may be here left, basically younger preachers, I'm leaving this thought behind. And it's found in 2 Peter. 2 Peter, the fourth chapter. In fact, it's a one that they might share at my funeral. Dr. David Gibbs has promised to preach my graduation service. Uh, so you want to hear him speak, come to my graduation service. <laughs> <laughs> there are two firsts in scripture that makes me realize we're at the time of the Lord's return. In Luke 17, 25, it says, but first he must suffer many things of this generation and be rejected by it. And then as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot, you know that. That's first. Now that's the first thing we're seeing. And in Luke 21 it says, when you see these things begin, to come to pass, look up, look up, because it's not far off, and that's what I want to do. Now Paul gave that command to Timothy. He said to Timothy to, to be sure and preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. He said, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and uh, doctrine, he says. For the time will come when men will not want sound doctrine, but they'll go to teachers with itching ears. You know, I thank God your church and your pastor is dead with the gospel. Aren't you? Yes. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's not what we've done, but it's what he's done. And his love for us. Oh, what love. And then Paul said to Timothy, he said, Timothy, I'm now ready to be offered, the time of my departure is at hand. There in that sixth verse, he said, Timothy, I'm going up to be with the Lord. And he said, it won't be long. But he said, Timothy, I want you to know, now watch this. Three major things Paul told Timothy. Because in that second chapter, that second verse, he said, the things that thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach and train others also. That's 2 Timothy 2, 2. But in that fourth chapter, verse 6, he says that, Timothy, I have fought a good fight. Do you know the Christian life to fight? Fight against evil. Satan's out to try to get us all down. Satan doesn't want us to be victorious. Satan doesn't want us to see Christ glorified in our life. Yet the Lord said, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of Christ. Mm -hmm. But Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, I've fought a good fight. I have. And Timothy, he says, I've, I've, I've kept the course. I've kept on course. I didn't get off base. I stayed with it. Oh, I know what it's like to be on a ship wrecked at sea. He said, I know what it'd be like to crawl out from under a heap of stones of Lystra. Well, I know, Timothy. And Timothy, that basket I came over the wall with, on Damascus, I, I know what it's like. People were always after me. Always trying to get me, Timothy. And I kept on course. I fought a good fight, I kept on course, and listen to this. He said, I've kept the faith. Yeah. I've kept the faith. I didn't digress. The faith entailed the whole of the Christian doctrine, which entailed repentance. The first sermon that that John the Baptist preached was repent. The first sermon Jesus preached was repent. The first Peter sermon Peter preached was repent. The first sermon Paul repent. Methanael said, I want men and women to have a change about themselves and about God. God loves them. Christ died for them, Paul said. I want them to know about that. Well, Paul said, I, I have stayed on course. And I've kept the faith, and I've seen the Lord bless him. And henceforth, now let this, this is for all of us. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge, the Lord Jesus, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? That crown's waiting for us. 
see the beam of seats what takes place after the rapture. Can you imagine we're going to see Jesus face to face? Isn't that something? Yes. I guess I got a burden way back. People would come when I was first pastoring the church, so many with needs, and I tried to help them. Some of them I found out were in desperate need and needed help. And I, I found this little poem years ago that kind of tied in with starting the mission. I'm sure you've heard it. Don't mind me giving it to you again. You see, that? because I think it's wonderful. See, I many times I look back at little things in life that God used to bring out a point. See, it was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it worth his while to change, take much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. Now, what am I bidding, good folks? He cried. Uh, who start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two, only two? Uh, two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going in, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and he picked up the bow and wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody, pure and sweet, as the heavenly angels sing. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now what am I bid for the old pile then? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars? Who make it two? A two thousand? Who make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered. But some of them cried, we just don't quite understand. What changed the worth of the old violin? Quick came the reply, "Twas a touch of the master's hand. <laughs> and many a life man was life out of tune and battered and scarred by sin. is auction cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin, going once, going twice, Gone, he's almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. God touches lives through his love for us. I don't know why he loves us, but he does. I've learned in the ministry that love, a loving person is always a giving person. A loving person is very giving and forgiving, I might add. Mm -hmm. I find in life so many times people are bitter down so someone. I want to say this, get rid of any bitterness if there's any in your heart whatsoever. Bitterness is the key thing Satan uses to keep God's children from doing what God would have yeah. them to do. And there he says in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, he says, Paul wrote to this Christian gang at Corinth. There was a man there that got saved from the first chapter, verse 5, undoubtedly. He committed adultery, but he confessed and got his life right. Some of the people weren't willing to forgive him, but he had truly repented. And Paul wrote him and said, I beseech you, brethren, that you would confirm your love toward this one. For this reason also did I write unto you that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Mm -hmm. For to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. And if I forgive anything, for your sakes forgive I it. In the person of Christ, now get this, folks, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Satan takes advantage of a bitter spirit. That's why Paul says, there in Ephesians says, let all bitterness and wrath be done away with. Get rid of it. And then I find so often, we try to do things in the flesh rather than the spirit. There in 2 Timothy, the 10th chapter, 2 Corinthians, 
It says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having therein a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That's why it's good to obey the Lord, folks. Jesus said to his disciples, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I ask you to do? Just walking with the Lord. That's so key. So key, isn't it? Well, it's just wonderful to be alive in these important days, to redeem the time. Last year, I shared a poem with you I wrote. I want to wrap it up with that poem. And I want you to know these are important days. We may hear that shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. It's getting close. Yes. Getting close. And people not paying attention to it. But I want you to listen to this. I'm not as young now as once I used to be. I'm in my latter years, and there ain't much going for me. When I review my past and the things which now I see, God gives me great encouragement how he took good care of me. My blessings have been many, my trials not a few, but God was always there for me and his grace has seen me through. I have a beautiful home in glory that God has prepared for me. It's free of sin, sickness, and sorrow, and no more crying there will be. There I will be with him like him, saved in the twinkling of an eye, there to dwell for all eternity with loved ones I once said goodbye. Isn't that a good one? Yes. yes. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're so thankful for the way you so personally take concern about us in our, our lives and relationship to you and what you've done for us. We thank you for heaven as our home to look forward to, all because you loved us. You loved us, Lord. <coughs> Forgive us for many times, Lord, we, we fail you. We, we let you down. Lord, help us to, to depend upon you and the strength of the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit to empower us to let others see Jesus in and through us. May others be attracted to the Savior, wherever we are at work, the place of business, wherever, Lord. May you be glorified in and through our lives. Thank you for this dear pastor here, Pastor Paul, for the tellings, for the years of faithfulness, and faithful people that have stayed with him. Thank you for faithful people. Thank you for Ron giving emphasis to this wonderful time we have every year together like this. Thank you for him. Thank you for Chuck and all of those, Mary and different ones, Linda. Thank you for all of these that are here. <coughs> May they be blessed of you, encouraging you. May they honor and glorify you through the rest of their life till Jesus comes. Yes. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, Ron, we got you. <coughs> Wonderful.